welcome. Uh, we don't have a mic, I'm going to do my best to project. My name is Ray Moshara. I'm a Vice President and uh, Director of the Assets Program at the New America Foundation. Uh, before we get started, I would like to uh, recognize the uh, Rockefeller Foundation uh, for three things. One, for putting extra effort into today's events, which we very much appreciate. Secondly, for their generous support of New America's work on the next social contract and uh, flexible savings. And also third, for supporting the work of two of our movements. Thank you very much. Um, also, the uh, Assets Program is pleased to be supported by the Ford Mott, Casey Perron, and Q Charitable Trust for our work here in D.C. Um, as many of you might have heard, uh, President Obama last week at Georgetown University said, we must lay a foundation for growth and prosperity, a foundation that will move us from an era of borrow and spend to an era where we save and invest. NEC Director Larry Summers over the weekend called for a less leveraged economy, one in which households are saving again, preparing to send their kids to college for their retirement and other purposes. And on Friday, Vice President Biden, through the Middle Class Task Force, uh, committed to renewing and improving what are now a fairly regressive 529 college savings plan, uh, which was incredibly well timed since we had just launched an initiative on progressive 529s in New America called the College Savings Initiative. So if you think about the last few days, uh, it's really been a good week for those of us in the savings community. Uh, this is music to our ears, this commitment to move toward a save and invest economy. The last seven years, the Assets Program has been promoting policies to increase household savings, especially among low-income and moderate-income households, um, a goal that I know that this administration fully shares uh, through, uh, which is also reflected in the budget document we put out in February. The assets program, the way we think about this work, is that we, we believe that savings should be throughout the life course, cradle to grave, and especially in ways that are, that are easy and automatic. The, the behavioral revolution has revolutionized us, uh, and everything we do uh, reflects that thinking. And secondly, savings should be for higher education, small business, home, retirement, as well as for unrestricted purposes. Uh, you know, completely unrestricted savings, which workers need, to avoid, uh, to weather economic storms, to avoid raiding their restricted accounts, and to avoid payday lenders. Uh, CDs and savings bonds in particular hold a lot of promise uh, in that front. Uh, we have a publication called the Assets Agenda. I'm not sure if it's in your publications, but we have 83 ideas uh, there. And our 2009 ledge priorities on your, uh, on your chairs is sort of the best of at the moment. Uh, um, one of the key moments to facilitate savings and investment for all these purposes, uh, especially for low and moderate income Americans, is at tax time. Uh, some of you know that uh, for households under making uh, under 40000 a year, the refunds average almost $1,700 per year. This opportunity to leverage those refunds at tax time is, of course, the focus of our uh, panelists today. Uh, and we have three outstanding panelists. They're all pioneers in the field, the ones who who give people like me credibility by generating data and, and, and great ideas. Um, but to set the broader stage uh, for our event today and to say more about the administration's uh, admirable goals of creating a uh, saving and uh, best economy, uh, we're truly honored that Jason Furman is with us today. Uh, Jason is the Deputy Director of the National Economic Council at the White House. Uh, prior to that, he directed the Hamilton Project at the Brookings Institution, was a senior fellow at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, served in the Clinton White House at the World Bank, was a scholar and lecturer at NYU, Columbia, and Yale. He holds several degrees from Harvard as well as from the London School of Economics. Um, Jason, as many of you know, is one of the most thoughtful and, and honest uh, economists of our time, uh, willing to take uh, unpopular positions if supported by the data. Um, and at his defense of Walmart, his very unpopular defense of Walmart, um, as essentially a net gain to the poor uh, comes to mind. Uh, Jason has also long advocated uh, for the U.S. to improve its abysmal national savings rate, so he brings a lot of credibility as well as personal interest to our event. Jason? Thank you, um, Ray, the uh, New America Foundation, and everyone for organizing this. I think it's a really important topic. And 
it's worth actually taking a moment to talk about um, you know why it's important in a time like this. And your title was something to the effect of savings at tax time. Um, I want to talk about why we're talking about national savings in the middle of the biggest economic crisis since the Great Depression. Since there are certainly some who have come to us and asked us um, that question. And Ray really, by quoting the president last week, gave you the answer, which is that we don't want to just get through the economic crisis we're in today. We want to build um, a foundation of a stronger economy when we come out of that crisis. And if the president could wave a magic wand and return the economy to 2007, um, when we weren't in a recession, um, we weren't in this deep economic crisis, um, he wouldn't find that a very satisfying outcome to his economic policy, because he'd be waving a wand and bring us back to a time when the typical family had seen its income decline by $2,000, when um, savings rates were essentially zero, when wealth disparities were enormous, when the cost of health care was skyrocketing, when America was increasing its dependence on foreign oil, and um, when we had numerous problems in our education system, from you know, the cost of college going up more quickly than the cost of health care, to, um, to, to, to problems in K-12 and, and preschool. So the goal of his overall agenda is not just to get us through the recession, but to deal with some of the problems that helped give rise to the recession, like the over-leveraging and the greater risk-taking so that we're less vulnerable in the future, and then to build an economy that's on a firmer foundation, not sort of lurching from bubble to bubble, um, but, but sustainable growth. When you talk about raising um, the personal savings rate, a lot of you spent a long time, I've spent a long time on this topic, um, and you know, I don't think any of you came up with a policy that would be quite as successful as what we've done in the last year, where we've taken the personal savings rate from 0.4 to 4.2%. <laughs> and that is, um, that's sort of the bad way uh, to, to increase savings, which is to have people's consumption um, dramatically um, fall off a cliff. And that's the other paradox that you have, and you have this on the fiscal side of right now we're running obviously a very large deficit this year. And we're running a large deficit in part because the economy is in weak, and in part deliberately because we're trying to stimulate the economy to get out of the recession. At the same time, we're making it very clear that we're on a path towards reducing the deficit, reducing it every year for the next five years, um, heading towards 3% of GDP, cutting it more than in half from what we inherited. And we think both of those policies are really important macroeconomically. The stimulus in the short run, but also giving investors the confidence that over the medium run, we're bringing the deficit under control so you don't see interest rates rise, so you don't see people lose confidence um, in the United States. And that is the essence of our fiscal policy. Well, it's less talked about, but I think there's something very analogous when it comes to personal savings as well. And if you think that there was a problem, um, welcome to the Congressman. When you think there is a problem in, um, you know, with, with the relationship between income and consumption, the bad way to solve that is to see people's consumption plummet overnight dramatically in the way it has in the last year. The good way to solve it is through a combination, first of all, of more strongly rising incomes, and second of all, more opportunities for families to transition into savings. And so part of what I view our macroeconomic efforts and things like the Making Work Pay Tax Cut and other efforts to help encourage and support and stabilize consumer spending over the next year is not about trying to put us into an unsustainable consume beyond our means forever and ever, but to, again, get us out of the recession and put us on a path towards making a more smooth adjustment to the types of savings rates um, that are more sustainable macroeconomically for our economy as a whole and um, individually for households that need to be adequately prepared um, for their retirement. And that's why, um, if you look at the President's budget, he proposed um, automatic IRAs and enhancing the savers credit, and both of those proposals had an effective date of 2011. Because the goal is, again, not to um, contract the economy, 
the goal is to get people to save and invest. And to save and invest at a time when we think we'll be through, um, you know, when we through the recession, through the period that we're in now. So we very much both in fiscal policy tried to think of how we stimulate the economy and then bring the deficit down, and then macroeconomic policy, how we support consumption, and then transition ourselves to a world where we're on a glide path of greater savings. Um, the philosophical um, underpinnings of the president's approach are very much grounded in the advances over the last decade in behavioral economics and thinking about um, the most important factor for people is not, you know, is the rate of return, you know, three or two, and you change some dial in the tax code to bring it from three to two, or two or three, or what have you. But, um, you know, what it is that is easy and automatic for people, what it is that, um, that um, uh, what institutional mechanisms uh, shape those choices. And certainly taxes, which you all are discussing today, is really one quite natural way to go about it. Um, we talked about automatic IRAs, and that's a proposal building on the fact that 75 million Americans, about half of Americans, don't have access to a pension plan at work. And this would um, require all but the smallest businesses to offer them an automatic IRA to give them um, the benefits of the portability, the benefits of the tax advantages, but also, um, perhaps more importantly, to default them into saving a certain amount unless they choose to opt out. The evidence is that for certain populations, you can see savings rates go from near 20% of people saving up to 80% of people saving. And that 80% is close to the sort of true amount that people want to do, but it's very close to what people would do under a so-called forced decision model make them actively choose either to save or to not save. Um, at the same time, we're concerned that the tax incentive for savings, um, they still matter somewhat. They matter for low-income families. They also matter for affordability, just as a matter of progressive wealth creation. We'd like to see low-income households and moderate-income households wealth grow um, more quickly so we can start to close some of the wealth gaps in our society. Right now, we have a tax system to encourage savings. It's upside down. It gives the largest rewards to the high-income families, relatively little, to low- and moderate-income families. The Savers Credit was a step towards remedying that, but it had some severe defects, um, including complexity, um, lack of refundability, and not, um, not applying to a broad enough range. The administration's proposal tries to address all three of those by making it fully refundable by making it a very simple matching structure of you contribute $1,000, we'll match you on $500, and taking a little bit further up the income scale than the existing um, savers credit. We think that these are two proposals that we're very excited about. Um, we think they're potentially um, transformative in terms of bringing tens of millions of people into the system um, who aren't in the system today. But um, more importantly, they're really a, we should take them as a signal to our approach to this issue, which is very much motivated by um, a lot of the types of innovative, neat ideas that you all are talking about. And some of these auto IRAs are just ideas that folks like the Retirement Security Project, for example, have developed over the last couple of years. So we're really looking at um, you know a number of ideas, and we're very open to them, and, and very open to the, the great work that. Congressman Blumenauer is doing, Congressman Pomeroy, Neil Bingaman in the Senate, and others, and, and looking forward to working together on all of your efforts. Happy to take a question or two. Um, what about automatic enrollment in 401k and the idea that Obama mentioned in his campaign about matching, government match for people below a certain income level? Mm -hmm. yeah. The proposal is. Um, for automatic enrollment in IRAs. Um, there's a little bit of confusion based on the way it was phrased in the February budget blueprint and the, and the full budget comes out or the what the proposal is. Um, and then the um, savers credit is in effect like creating a 401k for you if you don't have a 401k because it gives you, when you put the money in, you get the match um, just as if you had a 401k. That's what the, so I think it's 
I don't remember exactly what he said in the campaign, um, but it was, it's sort of the analogy of what he was drawing. That sort of everyone would have something like a 401k. Are you working with business groups that have expressed concern about the mandatory nature of the owner and the Yeah, we've had, um, we've had some conversations and certainly look forward to working with them. Part of the proposal is um, a tax credit to help small businesses offset the cost of establishing um, those plans. And, and we think the cost of establishing plans are relatively low. We can offset that cost and make it a proposition that's really win-win and attractive for the businesses and attractive for their employees. Is that a one-time tax credit, or is it ongoing? I believe it is one time. If somebody practices, I'm seeing a lot of not When you talk about these automatic enrollments into the IRAs for low and moderate income people, if you, is there any details on the composition of the portfolio that they would be interested? Would they be subject to the whims of the stock market, be given a, a safe treasury bond one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. First of all, if you make an active choice, then you would just be subject to the IRA rules because right. you're just setting up an IRA for yourself. What you want to do, though, is place a lot of care and attention on the people who don't make active choices and what happens to them and frankly what happens if their employer doesn't make a choice and what happens if they don't make a choice and where does their money go. Um, there are different proposals to how to deal with that. Um, the Neil and Benjamin bills with us and the retirement security project. Uh, it's, it's an issue that we're studying closely and we don't have our own um, explicit proposal but you want to make sure that the fees are quite low. You want to make sure um, <clears throat> that you're taking the appropriate types of risks, and um, that, that's a that's a pretty good job. Oh, so, I think you had a question. Right? So, well, no. Hi. Yes. Uh, the national, uh, the state and local governments defined contribution administrators for 401k plans, 457 plans, and 403b plans. Uh, have over the last couple of years worked with Con Congress, Senator Conrad, and the Senate. Allison Schwartz in the House to have resolutions in both of those chambers introduced calling for a national save for retirement week. This idea was endorsed by the Savers Summit several years ago. So each year they're introducing this resolution and the resolution speaks to many of the issues you're talking about and it's uh, for public and private employees and they've been doing radio spots, advertisements, you know, around the country um, and we're looking at, and then the counseling sessions, you know, they really focus use this week to focus on safer retirement. Um, they're looking at making this resolution permanent so that they don't have to go through this each year, and that would require a presidential proclamation in support of the president and the administration. Um, just wanted to put that out there to okay. you, and we would love to have uh, that happen and think that it's it would be very helpful. Okay. I'm certainly happy to take a look at it. Okay. I probably want to I said that. I think you probably want to get to your distinguished next sure. Thank you. So, thank you all very much. And, uh, who has represented Oregon's third district since 1996. Sorry there's no mic in here today. Uh, Congressman Blumenauer has devoted his entire career to public service, including making uh, Portland one of America's most livable cities. Uh, he serves on the Ways and Means and Budget Committees, as well as the new Select Committee on Energy Independence and Climate Change. Uh, today, he'll talk about his leadership in the Ways and Means Committee and in Congress on helping more Americans save for retirement and other purposes. Uh, Congressman, we're very honored to be on this stage. Thank you very much. I'd like, I appreciate the chance to uh, join with you for a sh uh, few moments. Uh, I had a chance to overlap a little bit listening to Jason. Uh, uh, there, things are different now, fundamentally different. We've been having discussions like this uh, on Capitol Hill. People have talked about some initiatives for automatic savings and talked about tweaking things a little bit. 
it's been a little hard to be able to get the momentum behind uh, support for the vast majority of savers. And as Jason said, the current incentives are absolutely upside down. Friends of mine take advantage of lots of provisions and they're thoughtful investors and I'm sure they are fueling the energy <coughs> or the inner engine of the economy. Uh, the fact is uh, we've got a huge problem right now because there are a number of people who are struggling. Uh, virtually uh, no one feels comfortable as far as looking forward to their retirement now as they've watched even prudent investors have watched their 401ks become 301ks and 201ks <laughs> if they're lucky. Um, uh, or we watch the 529, 529s, is that what they call it, savings, become 429s and so forth. Um, with uh, college freshmen and uh, sophomore coming on, uh, we're, we're watching uh, that uh, with more than passing years. Um, so part of what's going on now is that I think there is greater awareness that um, something has to be done, that pain is spread more broadly, and we're watching problems with some of the traditional mechanisms uh, that have uh, trapped the unwary, and in some cases some pretty sophisticated. Um, the second, so there's, this, is, this is a big deal now for lots of people. We've got their attention in ways that we have never had before. We have an administration, and I was uh, pleased that uh, Jason was here. I'm pleased with some of the pronouncements that the president has made. Uh, there is an administration that uh, I think genuinely feels that a priority needs to attach to this bottom part of the pyramid. They've got some proposals that have come forward uh, that I think make sense. There is uh, in, and I don't mean to sound unduly partisan, but I think the evidence suggests, just as you look at the allocation of benefits and who, who profited from the policies when my friends on the other side of the aisle were in control of the House uh, and in the White House, um, that the, uh, the priority was for investments for people actually who needed our benefits. Uh, this administration, I think, uh, is, is uh, committed to a different approach. I take them at their word, and I'm pleased with what they have done to this point to move forward. The other thing that makes a difference is that because of the way my friends on the other side of the aisle, uh, helped by Carl Rove and Tom DeLay, structured the tax program of President Bush, uh, everything's up for grabs, essentially, uh, over the course of the next few years. Things are going to change. Uh, the question is, uh, how much we're going to intervene and at what point, but it's all on the table in a way that it has never been. Now, I'm convinced that uh, Carl and uh, Tom had a different sort of uh, vision in mind in terms of who was going to be in charge and how they were going to allocate it, but nonetheless, this is a, this is a system that has forced everything out in the open, everything on the table at precisely the time that Americans, unlike any point in my public service career, which is longer than most of you have been alive, um, where people are paying attention, where the vulnerabilities have been exposed, where people are starting to pay you know, some heed to uh, the notion that um, our friend Warren Buffett talks about him paying a lower effective tax rate than the woman who answers the phone in his office. He of billions of dollars of uh, net wealth and tens of millions of dollars of income. I don't understand why he bothers with tens of millions of dollars of income being as smart as he is, but you know, uh, so be it. Um, this is fundamentally different. So that means that proposals that my friend, uh, Mr. Pomeroy, you'll be hearing about a little later, that, um, I am co-sponsoring and think it's a really good idea. Uh, we're working uh, with the, the folks at the New America Foundation on a uh, bonus um, program that, uh, offer, that uh, will uh, provide um, more opportunities uh, that would allow people to invest in different products uh, and actually to open up a new account directly on the tax form. Um, there are permutations on this stuff that we're going to have fun playing with on ways and means. We'll work with the administration and other interested parties, business groups, 
Um, but the fact is, uh, now's the time. Tax code is changing. We have the opportunity to up the ante for small and medium income savers in a way we've never had before. And we need to promote this savings. I mean, uh, we have had in the last, so far this, uh, this decade, this new century, uh, perhaps the lowest savings rate in our nation's history is now starting to go up just exactly the time maybe when we want them to spend money. Uh, but uh, we'll work that out. I don't think there's any problem. We're going to have to get real about investment in our country, and this is an opportunity to do it. And the automatic provisions, modest tax benefits, working with small and medium-sized employers, and I'm willing to scale it up further if necessary, to be able to broaden the sweep, uh, making sure that this is part of what is um, a very important conversation. I hope it can be done to promote taxpayer education, fiscal literacy. We've started in our community what we call fiscal fitness tour um, to talk about who pays taxes, talk about the state of the economy, look at the role that individuals play, and where we want to go forward. Uh, I hope that uh, others will also be thinking about investments in the physical infrastructure uh, to try to start promoting health of communities. Uh, that too will come. But in, in the meantime, I just wanted to uh, indicate my appreciation of working on, on refining the Savers Bonus Act, uh, trying to make sure that we are broadening the range of things that people can involve with, making it automatic and as simple as possible, and working with anybody who's interested in refining it. Ultimately, this will be part of a comprehensive piece of legislation. Uh, it may well be that it is just what happens with the tax reform coming out of the Ways and Means Committee. But I personally would lobby for a standalone piece of legislation that talks about equipping Americans to save for their future to have more choices, more information, and be part not just of a week of savings awareness, uh, but actually that this might be something we do for the next couple of years uh, to be able to really engage people in a way that, uh, that we haven't before. Uh, I appreciate the expression of interest, the partnerships that are being developed, uh, and the, the sense of expectation that this is the Congress that we'll be able to deliver on time when the economy is in free fall, where people have lost confidence in a lot of the financial institutions, and they're a little cranky about who, who gives who gets. I think this is precisely the time. to the Savers Bonus Act, which uh, we're hoping he will lead. Uh, Senator Martinez introduced his bill in the last Congress. We do two things different than what the current Savers Credit does. Um, it, it allows you to save for college through 529s and cover bills, as well as uh, savings bonds and CDs provided over 12 months or longer. And secondly, you can actually open up an account right on the tax return if you don't have um, some of you may have heard that Congressman Pomeroy was uh, held back in North Dakota because of the floods. Uh, however, we are very lucky to have Diane Oakley on his staff uh, join us today to say a few words. Uh, Diane, as some of you know, uh, is one of the most committed uh, staff persons in the U.S. Congress uh, working on savings issues. It's a lifelong commitment. And uh, we couldn't be happier to be working with her and, and Congressman Pomeroy on our savings agenda. Uh, some of you may know that Congressman Pomeroy uh, served in the last two Congresses as the co-chair of our Congressional Savings and Ownership Caucus. We're hopeful he'll continue in that role, and we hope to launch that caucus in the next few weeks in Congress. Diane? Well, on behalf of the Congressman, I'm very pleased to be here this afternoon. Uh, let me just say, in, in the town of Fargo, when, when the the Red River was rising the first time. In five days, they filled five million sand bins with volunteers in their community. 
if we could only have all those bags of sand be bags of money, I think what that would do to the economy. Um, I, but I think the, uh, the thrust of what people are talking about this today so far has been what I call that aha moment. You know, I, anybody who's worked with individuals trying to get them to save knows that at some point in time you get that that teachable moment occurs, uh, and I think the focus today of tying it to the tax code and the tax filing, uh, that aha moment sometimes comes from the tax code. And I'd like to just take a moment to tell a story that I'm sure the congressman would say about an aha moment that he had uh, with regard to savings. And it actually occurred at the Saber Summit two years ago, which was the last of the Saber Summits. Um, and the summit started off with uh, Sil Schieber, from Lots of Wyatt, giving a presentation and outlining the fact that the national savings rate had gone into negative at the end of 2005 and kind of was staying there. Personal savings wasn't quite as bad at that time. but uh, And then after that, every other speaker who came to the podium, um, the vice president at the time, congressional leaders, spoke of the wonderful economy we had and how much marvelous growth we had. And at the end of the summit, the congressman said, you know, I'm really disappointed we had this challenge laid out that we're not saving, and yet all we have is people talk about growth. And I think it really gets down to why, you know, the Obama discussion about we need to change the fundamentals, that a future built on debt is not a future that's sustainable economically. And so with that, I think you look at the teachable moment, what we've learned. The last couple of months, the American public has had a very strong teachable moment that has raised their savings levels up from 0 0.01 to 3 to 4 percent. Not quite what's the best thing for the economy at the, at the time, but I think it's a reality. There's a teachable moment when people realize, oh, I don't have any money if something happens in my situation. And so we start to look at what are teachable moments. They're tied very much for savings to what the congressman talks about as the the core functions of the American dream. Uh, they want a better education for their kids. They want their kids to go to college. They don't want to be a burden to their kids, which means they got to take care of themselves in retirement. And quite often, a lot of people want to get out on their own. They want to start a business. So how do we find ways to save for each of those? Uh, and where do we stand with that? You know, EBRI, the Employee Benefit Research Institute, just announced its most recent retirement confidence numbers, 13% down by half, which was pretty dismal two years ago at about 27. Uh, it was 18 last year, Another, so another fall off on that side. On the retiree side, where you know they, they've pretty much been there, they're also seeing a pretty much a half a decline in their level of confidence that they can live comfortably in retirement. And at the same time recently, uh, the Federal Reserve, unfortunately it's a little bit dated today, but they did release their survey of consumer finances information. And the numbers there were pretty startling when you think about it, especially that they are 2007 numbers. And so basically you take those numbers, you probably knock off a third to 40%. Uh, but the median value in a 401k plan for a worker was only $45,000. Now if you say, well, that's everybody. Well, those people who are closer to retirement, the median value in a 401k plan for workers between age 55 and 64 was $100,000 in 2007 401k dollars. Uh, that translates, the $100,000 would probably translate into maybe another six to $700 a month of income for life. That's not enough for most people to retire on. Um, so where do we go with those type of numbers? Uh, what the congressman has done is sort of looking at a threefold approach. Um, his most recent introduction of a bill has been the Savings for Americans via Families Future Act. Um, this bill uh, takes a look and it builds on what we know. We know the Savers Credit has demonstrated that it can encourage low-income families to save. And in fact, the Savers Credit's probably created <coughs> five million more new savers than who had not saved before the credit was available. And it does it at a pretty modest cost. The average tax benefit that someone who uses saver's credit gets is about $190. And right now, as, as Jason mentioned, that cap, it's a very complicated credit. 
it got that way because of the legislative process when someone said you only have so much money in the budget to do this all of a sudden what was ideally a 50% credit for everyone became a 50% credit for some people if they owe taxes but because it's not refundable it really almost becomes a phantom credit for most people at the 50% level and then it was a 10% and a 20% credit at some other income levels Simplifying it by making it 50% across the board, making it refundable, makes this a real credit for all American families who work and earn under $65,000 in a household with you know, a couple. So that's really what Mr. Palmer is looking at doing in, in his bill. And then we'd also take a look at some of the best things we know. We know from the work that the uh, Retirement Security Group did that Increasing people's savings over time is something you also need to do. So our bill takes the maximum benefit that someone can get under this of $500, and it increases that each year by $100. So we're going to encourage people to save. We're going to match people's savings. Why is that important? It's especially important today, not only for people who have not saved, but it's crucially important for low and moderate income families who currently are in 401k plans and are seeing almost every day another employer who makes an announcement that we're going to have to suspend our 401k contribution. We've already seen over 200 employers announce publicly, and those are the ones that make an announcement, as opposed to others that might not be making an announcement, saying, we just can't afford in today's economy to save, to match your savings. So this bill sort of has Uncle Sam pick up where their employer feels they can no longer do that and makes that 50% match that most employers have done. And so that's what that bill is all about. The other bill that Mr. Pomeroy introduced um, picks it up again on a New America recommendation about the 529 plans. Uh, families want to save for retirement, but they also want to save for their kids' education. It shouldn't be something where we reward them for one in one way and reward them for another in a different way. And so our bill would allow an individual, a parent, to direct his matching savers credit to a 529 plan instead of their retirement plan. So if they were someplace where they got an employer match into their pension and that got them into their pension plan, they could use the savers credit to help save for their children's education. And in fact, for many younger families, saving for their kids' education is a more immediate challenge than saving for retirement. And the last piece of uh, Mr. Pomeroy's agenda is one that we haven't quite introduced yet. And that deals with a proposal that in the last Congress, uh, Stephanie Tubbs Jones, uh, Mr. Pomeroy's uh, good friend and colleague, had uh, worked very strongly and strenuously supporting. And that is the idea of IDA accounts, individual development accounts. These are accounts that pull together a real experience of savings with a matching contribution from a financial institution and financial education, especially targeted to very low income individuals. Uh, there's flexibility to use them for education, there's flexibility to use them for retirement, to buy a home, or to start a business. And I think when you look at that, you cover the whole spectrum of where we hope to be. So with that, thank you very much. Oh, um, one, one question. question for Diane. Yeah, what are the bill numbers on, on the uh, two bills you just mentioned? Um, this, the Savers Credit Bill is HR 1961. We could only save by the 60s. Uh, and then the other bill is uh, HR 1351. All right, thank you very much. Um, well, um, we are uh, ready to move to our panel discussion, our panelists, and talk about some very concrete things going on on the ground showing that the marriage between tax time and savings is actually a very good one. Um, you know, this is not just an idea. Um, you know, Tim Speeding wrote a paper many years ago saying this is a marriage between heaven and David and Kathy and, and, uh, and um, Tim, where's Tim? There you are, there you are. You know, have, have been the folks on the ground with real taxpayers, real families, trying to make a reality out of the fact that you know, you have these refunds and you can leverage them in the savings. It's not just a dream. The data is quite compelling. Um, so if you all three could come up to the uh, to the uh, table here and I will do introductions. The, um, let me start here. 
The, um, we're going to begin with uh, David Marsal, who is the executive director of the Center for Economic Progress uh, in Chicago. And, uh, you know, the thing about David's group, it's the umbrella organization for about 600 sites around the country that are doing free tax preparation for low income families. These 600 sites have become a perfect testing ground for a lot of ideas to, to actually leverage tax refunds and savings. Uh, and and uh, David has been one of the pioneers in the field. Uh, we work very closely with him in getting the split refunds effort uh, uh, established within the IRS, and uh, he remains a real champion uh, today. Um, after David, we will be hearing from Tim Flanka, who is the executive director of the uh, Doorways to Dream Fund. Um, and for those of you who don't know, uh, Doorways to Dream Fund is a, it started, was incubated at the Harvard Business School under uh, Peter Tufano, a Harvard uh, Business School professor and another real pioneer in the field. And Tim has been at his side for all the great work that they've done. Uh, when split refunds was just an idea, uh, Tim Flanke's group is out there in, in, in Oklahoma trying to generate data that this could work, and that data had a huge impact on the IRS's decision to go forward with this form. Uh, and, but they haven't stopped with split refunds. They're pioneering a prize link savings, modeling some programs that are in, in existence in the UK and South Africa. And today they're gonna talk about their very encouraging results that they've got with savings bonds. Uh, you know, if you offer low-income families that product, uh, what's the take-up rate? And I think they'll be very impressed with the data. And then uh, Kathy Mann is the uh, executive director of the Office of Financial Empowerment in New York City, a real coveted position. I have to say, and uh, to have a mayor who's really committed and serious about doing something about poverty. Uh, I first got to know Kathy when she was with the credit union uh, uh, movement and uh, was one of the first people in the field that I know of who was really promoting a proactive savings agenda within credit unions, although credit unions have been doing low-income savings for many years before these asset builders came along. Um, and uh, Kathy was also the director of the uh, Assets Funders Network, which also made her very popular uh, with all the want wannabes, uh, you know, people who wanted funding in the Assets Network. Uh, Kathy is uh, also at the forefront of a very interesting savings experiment uh, in Vita sites, low-income tax prep sites uh, in the area. And also, even though a little bit more preliminary, you know, the, the data that, that she's generated has been actually very encouraging uh, as well. So uh, we will take them in the order that I just introduced them. Uh, they have committed to doing no more than eight minutes. Uh, we got rid of the PowerPoints, although their presentations are on, on your desk, on your chairs, and at least I hope you'll refer to those because we do have a lot of data. We will hear from all three of them, and then uh, we'll moderate a discussion after that. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ray, uh, for the introduction. I guess the one lesson learned so far is in the future when we Name programs we should start uh, as Congressman Blumenhauer said instead of with high digits, low digits, so they can't sink anywhere below the number one. Uh, it's a little scary when you think 403Bs and uh, 529s and you can sink down into lower single digits. Uh, as Ray mentioned, uh, I run the Center for Economic Progress out of Chicago. Uh, we help hardworking low income families move from financial uncertainty to financial security. And obviously, at a time like this, uh, a mission like that is, uh, is really important. Um, we are both place-based in Illinois, but we also are national. To give you a sense of our place-based work, we couple tax preparation services with financial services, financial counseling, uh, and then we build that into a platform for our federal advocacy work. And Jonathan Noose is here, who's our advocacy director. Uh, to give you a sense, again, of the numbers that people serve, uh, last year we served 35,000 families during their tax returns, generated 45 million in refunds, half of that in earned income tax credit, and in our history, we brought back $300 million uh, to uh, low-income families in Illinois. Uh, our target market, families earning about 200% of poverty. So uh, in the sociological language, we're working for people who I think are struggling the most in today's economy. Um, we've also been an incubator for a lot of uh, programs uh, partnering with uh, the financial services sector, both credit unions, banks, and other uh, institutions. Uh, we've actually opened more than 7,000 accounts in the last several years, last uh, this year alone, during tax season, more than 1,700 new uh, accounts opened up at tax time. Everything from savings bonds, working with doorways to dreams, to a match program very similar to what was done in New York City with a local credit union, 
to prepay debit cards for people who otherwise would be unbanked and considered unbankable because of credit scores, but were actually able to load their refund directly onto a product. Uh, and then in terms of the federal work we do, we lead the National Community Tax Coalition. Ray mentioned that uh, we helped lead uh, efforts in the last few years and generated, uh, uh, secured an $8 million appropriation from Congress for the Community VITA uh, program, Volunteer Income Tax Assistance, and we're actually the largest statewide uh, provider of those types of services, but at the national level, uh, the goal was to build an infrastructure and several of uh, uh, the groups active in uh, our National Community Tax Coalition and CTC are here today. Also AARP, we partner with a lot of organizations around the country. And indeed, just to give you a sense of the demand for these kinds of services, uh, the grant program started last year four times as many applications received as were actually funded. Um, so that's not atypical. Uh, the National Community Tax Coalition itself, uh, which we are uh, kind of the parent of, brings together, as Ray said, 600 organizations from all walks of life from all over the country. Uh, the mission is to broaden the reach and impact of community tax and financial services while being a voice here in Washington, D.C. for low-wage workers and for low-income families. And we have national partnerships with uh, organizations uh, from the United Way of America, AARP, the National Disability Institute, New York City, uh, and then large local programs on the ground. There are programs um, in cities, in communities around the country preparing 10, 20, 30, even 45,000 tax returns. So there is significant volume going on at the community level. Uh, and in effect, we are the trade association for community-based VITA programs. To give you a sense of the impact of uh, community-based uh, VITA, uh, last year, 1.2 million tax returns were prepared by community-based programs around the country generating 1.1 billion in refunds. Uh, clients actually saved 177 million in tax return preparation costs and avoided at least, it was a very conservative figure, 8 million in fees that would be normally associated with the refund anticipation loan, uh, the loans, which are uh, short-term uh, products, uh, which I do think meet the definition generally of a predatory product. If we were to turn around that $177 million saved and say, take that money and put it into Series I bonds, currently earning 5.64 interest, as B2B does, that 177 million in 10 years would turn into 309 million dollars. So that gives you a sense of taking the money that gets taken off the table at tax time, if it were invested and used for something more long term, what the value would actually be. So we believe very strongly that tax time is a time to start savings. Uh, there is uh, enormous demand in communities for these types of services to give you a sense in Illinois, our organization alone, in terms of on-the-ground services, turned away one person for every person served in the month of February this year alone. Uh, and again, to, to frame it up clearly, a lot of money is being spent at tax time and being put in products that don't meet people's needs. So our goal more long-term is financial security for American workers. Uh, financial inclusion, financial direction, and moving people to financial opportunity. Uh, what does financial inclusion include? Uh, access to direct deposit. We believe that's absolutely critical. Uh, there was conversation earlier today with Jason Furman, automatic IRAs. If people don't have direct deposit in the workplace, what good is auto IRA? That's just, it's, it's, a, it's a simple thing to be done, but it isn't happening yet. There's, a, I think, a, a road to be followed here. Prepaid debit cards. Again, for people who are unbanked who might not have ability to access their traditional account, this is a way to get them in the door. It's being piloted at tax time. There are major financial institutions doing this. This could be made a lot simpler and more straightforward. Um, in terms of financial direction, we see a need for credit counseling and for financial coaching, uh, access to services, not just products, at tax time and beyond. After all, tax time is a three-month window. Uh, Last I checked, there were 12 months in the year. We need to look at this as a stepping stone to moving people to the financial mainstream. And financial opportunity is really the theme of, I think, today's discussion, a lot of the wonderful work that New America does, and that is moving people towards a savings goals, along a continuum from debt to savings. And that is both short-term savings products as well as more matched savings products that might move people towards long-term goals. Uh, th this is the time really, and I, I love the way it was framed by Congressman Blumenhauer, there's a huge opportunity right now in the midst of despair or the challenges we face to rebuild the financial architecture of our nation. And I think some of the discussion today really fits into that. So this is about accessing the financial mainstream, providing people relief from high interest debt, and providing opportunities to saving. And community programs around the country 
because of the volume of people served, have just incredible opportunity in terms of where they're going in the future. So just to give you a quick highlight of some of the programs, um, this is actually in your handout, so I'm gonna go very quickly here because my timekeeper has been very good here. Uh, one of our programs, Campaign for Working Families in Philadelphia, is a leader in financial product innovation. Prepaid debit cards at tax time. Demand is enormous. They increased fivefold from 2007 to 2008 to 2009. These types of products address the need of one in four low income Americans who are unbanked. Then we have a program uh, in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, the Department of Community Initiatives, part of the city of San Antonio, focusing on alternative refund anticipation loans, taking a predatory product and turning it into more a long-term uh, opportunity, and that is by making people save a part of what they get back as a quick-term loan into something more long-term. They've opened 2,500 of these accounts at tax time this year alone. And last but not least, we uh, you'll hear more about match savings programs. We partner with the program uh, in uh, Concord, New Hampshire, uh, working with a local bank that offers a CD product with, with a $200 match that they've had a take-up rate actually of about 15% on. So our policy recommendations, and you're obviously going to hear more about this from other people today, we believe in the critical need to expand free and accessible services for low-income workers. A need exists, the opportunity is there to increase funding for the federal VITA grant program, to expand just beyond tax preparation assistance, to add financial counseling, access to financial services for low-income families. Then uh, to design financial products that actually meet the needs of low-income workers. I mentioned earlier making access to direct deposit universal with new officials coming in treasury. Uh, there's a huge opportunity to use this opportunity, to use this, this, this new set of leadership to move in that direction. And we think treasury also can be sponsoring pilot programs that can drive innovation. Again, there's wonderful work going on in the private sector. Now government can truly be a partner. And finally, we heard about this earlier in terms of the savers credit. Just to give you a sense of the misalignment of the savers credit with the audience that it's supposed to serve, only 23% of those eligible to get it actually receive it currently. And I think it's wonderful, as Diane mentioned, that people are actually saving, but we think by making it refundable, opening up its uses, a lot more people will take advantage of it. Uh, so making federal savings credits available to all working families and adopting actually some kind of a federal match savings program for short-term needs. You're gonna hear from Kathy. I think people absolutely need to be incentivized to be pushed towards short-term savings, then they will consider long-term savings for retirement and for more long-term asset building needs. Uh, so finally, this is a once-in-a-generation opportunity. We're planning to be at the table. We believe that the expertise, the knowledge, the practical experience of groups like ours in communities around the country can work with government and the private sector to take advantage of this window. Thank you. Hi everybody, um, I just want to start by saying thank you all for coming and spending some of your valuable time to talk about this subject. Um, there are a lot of uh, people that are organized to uh, represent their interests uh, and I'm not sure that low income workers and prospective savers necessarily are at the top of that list and you've all chosen to come spend some time focused on that. It's also very nourishing to those of us who go out in the communities and do work to know that there are people here in Washington who help make decisions, who care to, to know what's going on, so that's a word of thanks. Um, Ray did a nice job of giving a, a sense of what my organization is about. We're the Doorways to Dreams Fund, or D2D. Is that a, can we tolerate that? I guess we just plow ahead with the noise. Um, we are a nonprofit organization focused on increasing access to financial services for lower income working families, especially asset building opportunities. And we do that by trying to look for innovative financial products and services. Sometimes those are newfangled ideas, and sometimes, as what we'll talk about today, they're actually old ideas that need to be taken out, dusted off, and looked at afresh. And certainly, uh, savings bonds, we think, would fit that description. So if your focus is on trying to promote savings for, for low-income workers, it's not a big stretch to get to tax time. And uh, this is maybe not the order that my PowerPoint is listed in, but there's a figure in there that I'll just uh, call out, and that is that $115 billion a year this is, I think, a 2005 number, is coming back in the form of federal refunds to families with incomes less than $40,000. By MARV research, that is the single largest transfer of money from the federal government <coughs> to working families, and it happens at tax time. A lot of people don't think about tax time that way, but there it is. So if we're interested in trying to think about saving, and this is maybe more on my presentation, you know, what do we need to save? 
Well, first of all, we need a source of money, right? I mean, all of us, we're not going to save if we don't have some money. The second thing we need, we think, is a mechanism to connect that source of money to something. And the last thing we need, and this is really where we get into the discussion of a product, we need a place to save. So we've got tax time, we've got a big pot of money, if you will, that's coming back, a lot of it through the earned income tax credit. We have now, for the last three years, through split refunds, we have, if you will, a set of pipes to easily connect tax refunds to various different destinations, including saving. And what we found is all of that put a spotlight on what was missing, and that is the place to save. And for those of us that are fortunate to come from a kind of middle income or, or, or upper income background, you know, it's like, well, how hard is that? You just go and open a savings account, right? Or, you know, there's a million people trying to sell me financial products. Why don't you pick one? Obviously, the story is not so simple. If you're, uh, you know, maybe working two or three part-time jobs, you may come from a culture, maybe another another country where you're not um, as comfortable with uh, the financial products world in the United States. A lot of different reasons why this question of where to save is a real bottleneck. So, uh, just yeah, it's also worth remembering that there are about 40 million families in the country that are either unbanked or underbanked. These are folks who just don't have access to what we think of as the mainstream financial services world. So if we think about what we would want in a product to address the needs of this audience, we can just kind of brainstorm. We would want something that was credible. We would want something that was probably safe. If you're going to start down a road of saving, you certainly don't want to see what's happened to the jokes today about 401ks you know, becoming 301ks. How would that feel if that was your first $100 of savings and you watched it fall in value? He wants something that was open to everyone. David made reference to the number of people that his organization and affiliates have served or tried to serve who are not able to open bank accounts because they're on basically blacklists. They're not allowed to. Um, you would want a product that had a good return. So you can see where this is going, and I encourage you to look at the PowerPoint. If you lay out the features of U.S. savings bonds against these barriers, it's really a very remarkable fit. I guess the shorthand way of saying it is, where else for 50 bucks can you get at the moment, 5.6% on your money with absolute safety, no fees, no credit checks. Anybody can have one. At PS, you can also save for your children. It turned out to be very important, you know, very, very big motivator. So we, we had this idea. We thought, gosh, when you have an idea, what's the thing to do? You test it. So we've now organized a series of pilot tests uh, over the last three tax seasons operating um, uh, two years ago with H&R Block. We actually worked with them in some of their offices. But for the last year, this year, and uh, two years ago, we've been in these Vita sites that Dave's described that his organization is really kind of the go-to place for. So we now, this past tax season that's just concluded, worked in 80 Vita sites, and we have some we have some results. So our first question was, would anybody want them? And we're pleased to say the answer is yes. So collectively, we've helped about 3,300 people at this point to order savings bonds, totaling about $615,000. Uh, those 3,300, 3,200 people have saved for over 5,000 people. So many of them save for their kids or for their grandkids or for their niece and nephew, that sort of thing. But perhaps equally important, we've seen about 9% of eligible people say yes to this offer. Now, people have different reactions to that figure. I can tell you that when we look at it stacked up next to other products that have been offered in tax sites, it's far, far higher. And I can tell you, when you think about the challenges facing people that are living on $19,000 a year trying to support a family, and almost one in 10 of them says, this is something I want to do. That's a powerful statement. So sort of headline number one, there is demand for this. Headline number two, you know, who buys them? Not surprisingly, they tend to be parents, tend to be female. Uh, our figures last year was that the average income of the buyers was right under $20,000. The other thing we found, and I'll just do a little quick quiz here. How many people had heard of US savings bonds before today? You all are actually quite similar to our research with lower income families. 74% of the people we surveyed said, yeah, I'm familiar with savings bonds. But just stop and think about that. If you tried to start with a new financial product and build that degree of awareness in this audience, you would spend years and millions upon millions of dollars. And it's right there, it exists. It's the byproduct of 70 years of a savings bond program of war bonds and celebrity promotions and all of it. And it's, it's, it's there, it may be withering, but it's there right now. Okay, so um, other findings, a lot of, uh, you know, I'm not going to read all this stuff because it is in your packets. A lot of evidence seems to suggest we're drawing in first-time savers, people who would not have chosen to save in the past. Something about this offer, this moment, connected to refunds, and this product makes people say yes. 
We've also seen that uh, contrary to a lot of expectations, a lot of people are saving for the long term. About 60% of the bonds are purchased for children, and that may be part of the reason that there's a long-term orientation. So let's just talk about sort of what it adds up to. And I think I, I glanced at my <coughs> colleagues' presentations a little bit today, and we all, I think, by uh, separate processes, arrived at kind of the same basic headlines. I mean, tax time is a huge opportunity. Uh, this audience that we're trying to serve wants to and will save if we make it easy or if we make it less hard for them. So we've got to remember that. Um, the second thing is, uh, you won't be surprised to hear me say, we think savings bonds play a really unique role and fill a hole in the savings landscape that not really any other product can fill. So we should recognize that. We have this national asset, we spent a lot of, of treasure and time building up its brand value. We should, we should look to it as a part of the solution to the savings puzzle. And then we should remember that bonds may draw in uh, parents and first-time savers. Um, so when we think about policy, we need to find a way to make saving an option at tax time. Our, you know, one of many preferred uh, uh, strategies is we would like to return to the 1960s when you actually could request that your refund be sent to you in the form of a savings bond. Many people don't necessarily realize this, but there is a precedent for connecting refunds to savings bonds. We now have split refunds. We'd like to see the very split refunds and this bond purchase such that people could say, I don't need my whole refund in the form of savings, but I'd sure like to get $100 or $200. And we should remember this issue about children. People are motivated to save for their children, possibly when they're not motivated to save even for themselves. And if that's what we need to kind of draw people in, that's as good a place to start as any. So if you are inclined to look at the presentation, we have a, a little uh, sample of what the 1962 Form 1048 looked like. Um, you'll chuckle because it's actually a half sheet of paper that was the entire form. Uh, but it does show you this uh, precedent of connecting tax time to saving through savings bonds. Thanks very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Kathy Mann, and I run uh, the New York City Office of Financial Empowerment. As uh, Ray had mentioned, our office was created um, by Mayor Ruhlberg as part of his broader anti-poverty effort. We were the first initiative to be rolled out as part of the Center for Economic Opportunity, which is really the initiative in New York that, that is running more than 40 different initiatives, all designed to sort of test ways that we can help New Yorkers start building their way out of poverty. Um, a quick rundown of the Office of Financial Empowerment. Our key sort of stra strategic priorities are to increase access to safe and affordable financial products and services for low-income and underbanked populations in the city, um, to improve and synchronize the delivery of financial education so that every New Yorker who needs help and needs guidance, counseling, what have you, has a place to go and can get that kind of uh, education and advice, and ultimately um, to protect New York City consumers in the financial services marketplace. And specifically, we take that part of our office um, particularly seriously in this environment where we do a lot about working with New York City consumers to make sure that they're clear and they're aware that New York City consumers cannot be deceived, misled, or defrauded in the financial services marketplace. And we do a lot of work to prevent that. Um, but t talking about um, sort of our access to safe and affordable financial products and services, we um, at OFE, we've been really charged um, really out of City Hall with being experimental about trying new things. Um, and there's a very big push to, you know, get out there, try a bunch of different things, and see what works. Uh, we put a heavy emphasis on evaluation, and we've been spending a lot of time, we'll talk to you a little bit, about some of the evaluations we've done on this particular program at the NYC. Um, but I think it's, it's interesting. I mean, the mayor certainly pushes us to do it. Um, we, we're encouraged to go out and get private sector funding. Um, with our more experimental um, programs and services so that we get a sense of what's working and what's not. So uh, last year at tax time, we started um, on a very small scale what we called the Save NYC program. And Save NYC, um, we got a little bit of, of funds together in time to get in, get something started in last year's tax season. And really, it's an account that's designed at tax time to help people put a part of their refund aside in a restricted access savings account. You need to keep it locked away for at least a year, and we will match you 50% uh, for the first $500 that you save in that account. So we'll match you up to $250. 
it must be direct deposited from uh, your tax refund. You must open it with uh, a minimum of $100 and you can put in as much as you want, um, knowing that the match will go up to $250. Um, importantly, we want to make sure that people were able to make additional deposits throughout the year, so the account is a little bit more flexible than say a typical CD structure. So you can continue to deposit throughout the year, but if you choose to withdraw during that one year period, you can always get access to your money. It's just that you forego the opportunity for a match. Oh my gosh, it's quick. Um, so you forego the opportunity to get your match. Um, and I think that was real important. We started it last year. Uh, we opened about 177 accounts. Uh, this year we were able to, uh, based on that uh, success, we were able to um, raise some more funds, and this year we were able to open, we raised enough money to match up to 1,000 accounts. We opened this year's tax season, and we were, uh, within eight weeks, we sort of stopped the program because we had had that more than 1,000 people come forward and want to do it. We operated out of uh, 12 different free tax preparation sites um, in the city. And so I think talking about some of the key findings, and you'll see we sort of walk through some of the data in the, in the presentations, some of the key findings exactly as Tim and David both say. I mean, given the opportunity and incentive and the right vehicle to do it, very low income people will, can and will save. And the tax time provides the sort of perfect opportunity. People are getting the largest, single largest check in some cases of the year um, at tax time. This is the opportunity that they're thinking about how they're gonna do it. And so marketing to them the fact that here's an opportunity to put a little bit of that aside and we'll be able to match you has really been effective. Um, the match money is obviously a powerful motivator. Uh, save, and, the, and then, then I'll get to some of the other findings in a second. But I, I want to just sort of talk about the first two points. The fact that individuals with very low incomes um, can and will commit to savings. Um, we had an average uh, participant income of about $15,000 a year. So, I mean, these are folks who really are kind of grappling with, you know, there's a lot of demands on that on that refund check, but the fact that we're offering this match, the fact that it's sort of convenient and at tax time, incentivize a lot of people to do it. Um, about um, uh, almost 40% of the people were not, were not even employed full time. So, the, one of the big questions we had had going into this is, is this something that's going to go towards people who are already motivated and inclined to do it? And what we were able to find is that, in fact, we were able to reach people who were not necessarily. The, the match money was really sort of the single biggest motivator that people identified, the reason why they did it. So about 38% of the people um, talked about said the match was the reason that they did it. Uh, about almost 20% said it was trust in the financial institution. That, that did it. We worked with a lot of uh, sort of trusted small scale uh, community <coughs> development banks and community development credit unions to launch it. So the trust factor is also very significant. Um, we're finding that the Save NYC account already, even in its first year, um, is really already beginning to uh, change people's behavior. About 31% of the people who opened the accounts were unbanked at the start of the program. 72% had less than $500 in savings. And about 25% of respondents said that they had no intention of saving prior to the offer being made. So there's a good number of people who really sort of by getting this offer really were able to sort of take advantage of it. Um, at the time that people started, about 95% indicated that, uh, or at least you know, about two months into it when we surveyed folks, about 95% said that they were um, planning to keep their money in uh, to be able to get the match, and about 74% of people did. So, you know, very low income folks were able to keep that money in through a really rough year. Um, and 79% of the people who did keep it in all year have chosen to roll it over. Um, and about 33%, about a third of that, um, are folks who've actually continued to contribute to it. And actually, we're still getting the data for this year, so that number may even rise a little. Um, about 57%, a little over 50% of the people who chose to close their accounts um, did so uh, because of job loss, emergency, or, um, or children's needs. And I guess that gets us to the next point, which is one of the things we found that people are saving for a variety of reasons, but probably most significantly, a huge number of our target population are saving for emergencies. And that's a really important point when we're thinking about adjusting things and when we talk about policy in a minute. You know, that's a really big thing. For people who are extremely low income, who are living paycheck to paycheck, 
Everybody knows that ideally long-term savings is, is an ideal thing and something we should be striving for, but it's those intermediate and shorter-term emergencies that keep people up at night. And those are the things that people want to know that they can get access to this money if they're able to when they need it. So there is an important, I think, element about, it was over 69% of the people said that, say, that emergencies uh, was a major reason why they, why they were saving. Children, another, you know, another major reason. Education, theirs or their children. Health care, sort of all those are, are kind of key reasons. And that sort of gets us to the, the sort of policy implications, I think, of what we found so far in our study. Um, as everybody said today, tax time really provides us a phenomenal opportunity and this teachable moment um, to be able to carve out and get into a, a pathway of savings. It's in the largest paycheck. The idea of getting it as easy as possible, auto enrollment is huge. Getting people in in easily and out a little bit more difficultly, and you know, more difficultly is, is gonna be the way, I think, to really start people on a pathway towards savings. Um, the match financial incentives uh, really do, uh, you know, really do play a huge role. They convince people that it's worth, um, it's worth foregoing their sort of immediate term needs. Uh, the people saving for the full gamut of needs, but specifically those short-term emergency funds are very, very important. And I think lastly, you know, the fact that we're able to kind of, there's a number of different opportunities to think about leveraging different tax, tax opportunities. In New York State, for New York City, for example, we not only have a federal EITC, we have a state and a city EITC. So sort of all of those pieces coming together, I think we can really think about what we also need at the state and city level to complement some of the great initiatives that you're talking about here on the federal level. So with that, I'll stop. Uh, this, is, this is great data, very encouraging. I suspect that if Susan Boyle were offered the opportunity to save, she would. <laughs> Some of you She's not employed, she's never had a job, but I think presented with the opportunity to as well. Um, I think it's really interesting uh, for those of you who've been in the savings and assets field for a long time, you know, the evolution of the field. Ten years ago, everybody assumed that the poor could not save, low income people could not save, and we were dismissed by policymakers and others. And the discussion is actually very different now. It's no longer whether or not they can save, but it's what they're saving for, what structures make it possible, um, you know, how long does the money last, what difference it has on their thinking and their outlook. So it's really great to be in a discussion where we're not, we're not debating whether or not this is even possible. It's clearly very possible, and I think uh, it's also quite clear that tax time is one of those golden opportunities. Um, the, um, and I think the matches are quite important. Uh, that's clear as well. We've also learned that structure matters. If you facilitate a savings opportunity, it's likely to happen. You don't necessarily even, sometimes money isn't even the most most important determinant of savings. It's actually the structure. There's some data that suggests that as well. Uh, we have about 10 minutes, uh, 15 minutes perhaps, uh, for questions. Uh, anybody? Yes, Laura. Hi, um, I have a question for David. You had mentioned that um, a lot of people don't have access to direct deposits, so auto IRA doesn't work for them, but I'm just wondering if you can get up the numbers or really have a percentage. I don't have it handy. I know there have been deposits, uh, there, there have been studies done by um, some of the human resource associations that up to a quarter of all workers lack access whatsoever through their employer. And the issue at the core is that employers have just made the decision it's easier to not offer it and to either cut checks or to offer increasingly in many areas of low wage work uh, these cards where they load the money onto. But the problem is a lot of these are dead end products. These are cards that can't be reloaded from other sources. And so it reduces their payroll transaction costs, but it has a very low utility function for the workers. So I think the, the, the long end of it is I think you could have a man, you know, certainly there could be a mandate to employers to offer it, but you need maybe some incentive to move them over to offer direct deposit. And then the flip side is direct deposit into a good product as well. For those of you who might not know, uh, Melissa Quaidy um, on our staff has a proposal for a public safety account, which essentially is a prepaid card, but it is reloadable. It can hold savings. You can put government payments, payroll deposits, 
all those things kind of uh, on it. There's a possibility that this will be piloted by uh, by the IRS sometime in the next couple of years. So stay tuned. Yes, uh, Alan, and then in the back. Ray, on savings bonds in particular, I do remember all of those drives to encourage people to buy savings bonds. But in recent years, Treasury Department seems to be not very interested in that. Right. Well, what about that side of the... Of the well, budget? I'm sure Tim can say more about that. We know that the marketing budget was zeroed out uh, in the previous administration. I think part of the proposal is not just to have it back on tax returns, but to you know to sort of ramp up that marketing budget as well. Yeah, those two obviously go hand in hand. Yeah. Yes. I'm not sure if we're answering your question. That's yeah, and there's there's all kinds of things you can do. My colleague David Newell has an idea for green bonds. You know, you can use the funds to fund environmental projects. I mean, there's all kinds of things one can do with the savings bonds infrastructure if you really wanted to. Yes, sir. I've heard some express concern that with some of these programs, uh, possibly some of the increase in savings could be offset by people uh, running up more credit card debt if they either choose to or, or need to spend the same amount of money. Uh, is there been any data collected on whether that's happening to some extent? I'll just say um, that is a major area. One of the things um, we have our first year data, you know, which I talked about, but one of the major things that we're studying in the long term is not just can people save and how do we make it scalable and how do we create the right mechanisms, but does the mere fact that people have started down a pathway of savings change the way they think about and act in their current financial situation? And so we've gotten some, you know, in our first year we've gotten some focus group kind of feedback that in fact people now feel a little bit more empowered, they're starting to think about, boy, for every dollar that I'm saving I could be putting it aside in this account, I could be doing all these other things with it. Um, in terms of, but that's exactly, I think, the, the critical long-term impact piece um, that we were particularly looking at. Um, my colleague in the back of the room, Caitlin Brazil, has um, connected us with, uh, we're going to do an independent evaluation of this over the next several years. And we're really going to be looking at these families and how that changes their general financial picture. It's a great question, and I would just comment that uh, when we first started testing mass savings through IEAs and we were worried that people would forego going to the doctor, um, paying to eat in order to save. And it turns out that the savings were generated largely from consumption efficiencies attributed to financial education. So they were smarter about their credit cards, they shop more carefully. So there was really no uh, visible reduction in their standard of living because they had room to save. So perhaps we'll be as lucky on the credit card industry as well. Um, yes, sir, and then Peter. I wanted to ask about saving for emergencies versus savings for long term because the latter would seem more relevant to getting out of poverty. Uh, but but I, I wanted to piggyback one of his previous questions too because we know that if you give hikers on the Appalachian Trail access to a cell phone, they're more, they're more apt to take risks, pack less emergency gear with them, go off the trail more. And we know this applies to financial products as well. That if people think there's more security, they'll take greater risks. So it's a very tricky business to do the risk management side of this. And that applies as well, perhaps, I'd be interested in your comments, to savings for the long term. I mean, we get the impression that once people have more income, they have a longer term horizon and think about savings for the long term. And on the other hand, there are these nagging questions about do we need a nudge in order to make that happen or more likely to happen? I think it's a, it, what you raise is, is exactly, I mean, this is sort of the, the, the key piece of how you make these savings vehicles, which I, are and should be designed for long-term savings, and make them um, accessible to, low in, to the lowest income folks, the most vulnerable in our population. And I think one of them is sort of the, you know, making the refundable credit and sort of making it so that it, it actually makes sense for folks, but I think also, People, I think, in the lowest rungs are really concerned about emergencies and they're afraid of tying up money. And so one of the ideas, and I think in terms of the policy, is thinking about creating a long-term savings vehicle that has the ability for people to deal with emergency <coughs> withdrawals or have some, you know, to have something that allows this sort of emergency window. Because I do think it is the long-term goal is, is for, is, you know, the big goal is for long-term savings. But I think you miss a big part of the population. And we've sort of found that 
more goal-oriented, longer-term vehicles apply and appeal to people who are already there mentally. We're already goal-oriented and thinking longer term. You know, the assets field started with this notion of or should be saving for long-term productive assets, and then we backed into the importance of emergency savings. Two-thirds of the account holders who had IDAs, two-thirds forfeited a two-to-one match in order to get into savings because they had to fix the car or the washing machine or avert some sort of a disaster. And so the, the, the insight, the recommendation then is not that IDAs fail, but that low-income people like all of us have a range of savings needs. And so, you know, we've put a lot of energy in the last two years, and thanks to the support of uh, Rockefeller uh, and others, we're piloting some ideas. Because I think if you don't do that, they're going to raid uh, their long-term savings. They're, they're more likely to use payday lenders and other alternative financial services, um, and they're not, and they're not, and they're less likely to save on the longer-term products as well. So I think it's an incre increasingly important part of the agenda. Uh, going forward. I mean, one additional comment, one thing, we, we did a whole series of focus groups as part of uh, an initiative called Financial Opportunities Project. One thing we found out is that, something I talked to Kathy about once, is that low-income people interested in savings also like the idea of having an accessible savings account, but that's not too accessible. In other words, that's maybe a little separate off to the side. So we need to make the entry easy but the exit may be not just to you know, push a button at the ATM and get your money out. And I think this would be why we need, I think, some more studies. I think that's very different than long-term savings, but it's even the ability, using the term nudge, I think we've heard it through you know, Sunstein and Thaler, get, make people go through a couple extra hoops, but let them still access it if they have to. And I would just add that even unrestricted savings should be on autopilot, where if possible, uh, reads come up with an idea where you do automatic payroll deductions, not just for IRAs, but also for flexible savings, if we're testing the idea. Um, Peter and then Reed, yes. So 100 billion some dollars of the stimulus is being de delivered to individual taxpayers through the tax code, through really helpful policies like expanded earned income tax credit, expanded child tax credit. I'm wondering what your organization specifically are doing and, and what you think policymakers need to do to make sure that the kind of predatory tax preparation and other things don't trick people into, oh, you've got an extra $100 and I'm putting an extra $400 in my pocket at tax time, particularly in 2009, 2010, when this $100 billion is really well, I, I know. I, I think this is. I mean, it's one of the big challenges is to make the pay credit already is flowing into people's paychecks. So, what the administration has done, I mean, it's it's making the tax code more progressive for low income earners, but it's also making it incredibly more complex. So, they've made it more complicated. Uh, they actually have, a, you know, given authority to Austin Goolsbee to convene a panel to look at, you know, simplifying the tax code down the road. We're already beginning to look at, and we just end April 15th, which was last week, say. We're worried about, as you said, 2010 when people file their taxes, that private industry is going to be out there figuring out how can we get hold of this money. So I think we're going to have to get very, the strategy is in place, but we're going to have to get creative and think this thing through because I think there is not, you know, the, the, you know, from a marketing perspective, they can draw people in, people are going to realize, hey, there's more money for me, but then they can take more off the top. And I think the flip side of that is there's clearly a need to provide for, uh, you know, either Regulate, uh, I think right, there's, there's no regulation of the tax preparation industry whatsoever. There's no floor that has been established by the IRS or by Treasury. So I think that needs to be thought of. There's been some legislation introduced in prior sessions of Congress. And that, I think, that requirement could then also begin to look at products such as refund anticipation loans and not bar them, but just, again, make them more difficult for people to access. Uh, and I think create a, a sense of, in this industry, that they need to be more responsible in terms of how they serve the needs of all taxpayers. Reed? Yeah, yeah, just a, a comment to connect uh, some of this discussion with what we're talking about today, where you know clearly there's a policy agenda around uh, encouraging savings at this moment, at this time of tax time. But there is, is also a large uh, policy agenda around looking at oversight of what, what the products are, what the financial services are, what the credit card practices are. It, it's another session. Uh, uh, we'd like to convene it. Uh, uh, there's a lot of people that, that could participate there as well. But those, uh, uh, we, we know people need to balance uh, good credit you know, with savings, but the problem is they're often uh, faced with a lot of choices about products that are predatory that don't work for them, and that there's a real policy agenda around that at this moment in time. It's probably some sticks, but hopefully we're putting a lot of really good carrots out there to make it more attractive to save. 
Um, yes, sir. Yeah. My question is for Kathy, and since your program is more specifically tied to a city that also has benefits and um, things that are offered to low-income uh, clientele, did you guys work at doing some sort of tie to the asset tests that may be involved in some of those other programs so that they could take advantage of things, even if they had saved a significant Above, yeah, well, we, ha luck uh, well, we, we haven't yet gotten to, um, to our uh, asset limits, um, but we are already having discussions with our local human resource. It's on a you know city by city, or I guess county by county basis, but we've been having discussions with our human resources administration about ways that we can get waivers for folks who might hit the asset limit. Was that ever brought up, up from the people who participated as something they were concerned about in their question and answers? I think it was, a, yeah, it was. I think it was a, It was not a huge percentage, but I think there was a percentage of people who did, you know, who, ha, who are worried longer term that they might hit up against that $2,000, you know, asset limit. So we're trying to figure out as we're getting people to, you know, we, we have another year or so to go before they hit that point, so we're now beginning to have those conversations about getting this. But it, it's an excellent question, and it's an important one, I think, in the longer term for us to be addressing more universally. Speaking of, um, Jason did not mention this in his remarks, but the, uh, the sort of the fourth main piece of the administration's uh, savings agenda is to, is to reform asset limits and public assistance <coughs> programs going beyond the reforms uh, that were enacted uh, in the uh, food stamp program. And the few discussions I've had with the administration recently, this is the question I always ask about. What, what are your ideas on getting rid of asset limits and public assistance program? But even if you do that, you have the perception that those asset limits still apply even if they've been eradicated in the law, and that's a hard challenge. Yes, yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> I'm with the uh, treasurydirect.com mm -hmm. site from Treasury, and I'm curious as to know how your organizations have um, or viewed an online service like this for the free establishment of these free accounts of the Treasury Direct, uh, purchasing savings bonds from 25 and up, and um, Treasury bills, notes and bonds. Hundred dollars enough. Um, how do you see that online service working into to building assets for the future for your for low income savings? Tim, yeah, I mean, we, we actually did some focused research on that this year, and we're still kind of tabulating the results. But we can give you, you know, in a couple of weeks, probably more detailed answers. But I think the short answer is there's a segment of people that want that and that will do it. Now, you know, the next question is. Just because somebody says they'd like to buy something online and manage it online, they may be imagining Amazon.com or something that's been calibrated, you know, through a number of years to sort of be the easiest possible way to purchase something online. So I think just because somebody says they want to do it, then we have to show them the actual site and have them say, well, you know, this doesn't make sense to me, and why is this here? And, you know, those kinds of questions need to be studied. But in concept, there's a segment that will do it. But there's also a segment on the other end that won't and probably never will. And then there's a segment in the middle, and these are going to change over time. You know, if we had the data, we could go back three years or six years or ten years, we'd be able to see those proportions changing. And I think they'll continue to change. But I don't think we're at the point yet where the proportions are such that we can rely on a, a exclusively online channel to try and reach the most vulnerable people. And I think we're several years or maybe longer away from that tipping point. Does that make sense? Oh well, yeah. yeah. Well, let me let me just close with one one thought, if I could. Um, it's it's. Um, you know, it's important to understand that you don't, the government does not have to spend a lot of money to increase savings by, by billions of dollars. Auto 401k, uh, enacted essentially through the Pension Protection Act, just clearing some legal hurdles, and split refunds enacted a couple of years ago, together co cost the government absolutely nothing except for some time folks at Treasury and IRS. They have literally generated billions of dollars of new savings by low income families. A lot of the innovations we're talking about today, uh, savings bonds back on tax returns, connecting with taxes to the CDs, these don't cost any money as well. This facilitation point is really important. Matches are important. We, we can spend a lot of money. We have an idea for a savings account at birth for every child. That will cost a lot of money. Uh, but the important point here is that there's, there's a lot we can do in an era of trillion-dollar deficits that doesn't cost money. And I think what, of our, what our panelists have done today is not only demonstrate that you know savings and tax time really deserve a long-term marriage, uh, but that it also doesn't have to cost very much money in order to make great progress on this front. So thank you very much, everybody.